All right, I think we can get started. Stop this. Welcome everyone. I'm Anthony Maricola, the Manager of Information and Adult Services. And on behalf of the Ferguson Library, I thank you for joining us this evening. We have a wonderful program for you. Business, pro, uh, business person and marketing powerhouse, Osama St. John, will discuss her memoir, The Urgent Life, My Story of Love, Loss and Survival. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Kofi Apeteng, as well as Bruce Hubbard, for their help in making this program possible. Throughout the program, if you have any questions for our guest, please use the Q&A feature that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, due to time, we may not be able to get to all of them, but we will certainly do our best. I'd like to now introduce our moderator for the evening, Ruthie Hubbard. Ruthie has worked 10 plus years as a sales strategy and marketing insights professional, known for driving business revenue and growth by transitioning data sets into insights. She leverages first and third party research tools to create compelling narratives that drive key product decisions across technology and financial service industries. Ruthie holds a bachelor's from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from Northwestern University. Thank you for being with us, Ruthie. Thank you, Anthony, and I'm so grateful to be here. Um, my name is Ruthie Hubbard, as Anthony just said, and I'm so honored to host this conversation on behalf of the Stanford Ferguson Library, on behalf of people who are finding their voice, the African diaspora, working mothers, and several other people who are here today to celebrate with us. And I'm especially honored to do this with someone whose career, larger than life persona, and um, starstruck ideas around everything that she's accomplished over the past few years. Bozema, I'm so grateful to connect with you today, and I can't wait to kick off this conversation. Thank you, Ruthie. I appreciate it. Glad of to be course. Here. Um, you're a newly minted author, you're a Hall of Fame marketing mastermind, you're a change maker, and a mother with more accolades that I can count. Thank you for opening up your heart to us. I can't wait to dig into where your spirit is now and how um, that has guided you into where you are today. Um, I did want to just give a little run of show to set uh, some expectations. We have 45 minutes for a discussion between you and I, and then I'm going to leave 15 minutes for Q&A. The key things that we're going to go over include race and womanhood, motherhood, personal growth and self-care, the author um, and book writing process, and of course, how to live life urgently, which is the title of the book today and why we are here. So how does that sound? Great. Let's go for it. Excellent. Perfect. So let's get into it. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask you was around essentially this idea of the focus of your book in terms of who you are as a Black woman and how this pops up in the three key areas, uh, survival, love, and loss. One of the things that I found super interesting is that you dedicated and acknowledged and highlighted several women who impacted you throughout the journey and you also had a complicated relationship and dynamic with people within that time as well. Can you unpack how that, um, you know, makes you feel today and how that impacts the decision to make the book? Um, well, look, I, I, maybe I'll start with the simpler version, which is, you know, how, how did I decide to do the book and why did I decide to write it now? You yeah. know, which um, for me is, is uh, you know, a memoir. I think all of us have a memoir. You know, is, of course, we're living our lives, we're right. experiencing dramas and traumas and losses and wins and scary moments and joyful moments. You know, it's like, it's the, it's the great narrative, the human narrative. You know, each of our lives are worthy of the story that should be told about them. And in the end of my book, in the acknowledgments, I talk about the Egyptian belief, the ancient Egyptian belief that a person dies twice. Right? First, of course, in the physical form as we all understand it. But the second, which I found more fascinating was when the last person to say your name dies. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a really beautiful way to think about narratives and immortality <laughs> and the reasons why we all exist. Right. You know, thinking about how our stories intersect and how many lives you can impact while you are here. You know, and I think for me, the, um, story that has been told mostly has been about my career and about the ways in which I've achieved in the corporate space and not so much about what I have overcome in my personal life. And so it felt like the time to write that book because there's so much being said about leadership and authentic leadership. Right. Uh, but how can you really be an authentic leader if you don't tell the things that scare you and make you sad and 
the things that you've overcome in order to get to the place you are. You know, none of us have these uh, silver spoons in our mouths, especially if you look like us, right? And so for me, it's been a journey of um, real survival. You know, it's like some people say, yeah. like, oh, well, you didn't just survive, you're thriving. And I'm like, no, give me the credit for surviving. You know, a lot of people don't survive, don't survive the journey. And so I'm, um, I felt very, very passionate about writing my memoir now because of where I have, what I have achieved in my corporate life and how I want to balance it with the story of my personal life. Uh, well, that's perfect. And that uh, leads me into my question, which is something I've seen you say, which is sometimes you don't appear as the hero in your own story. And my question to you in that regard is, when are you ready to acknowledge that that heroism really is in the idea of sharing your vulnerability, turning that into a strength, the reality that oftentimes when Black women do that, they're perceived differently than others. Frankly, I feel like you should be acknowledging that the fact that you're a hero at all times in your own stories, and it shouldn't be seen that way. Um, what do you think about that? And how does that make you feel? Uh, well, hero is a weird word. Mm. You know, it's it's just, it's strange. It's like, you know, there's um, <clears throat> just for Mother's Day, I posted a, a video using Mariah Carey's song, Hero. And I chose it not because it's like, look, heroism, I think we confuse for bravery and courage and valor and like all of these things where it's just like, no, actually it's about, again, it's about the overcoming. Right. You know, and, and heroes are not always liked. I mean, heroes aren't always the most courageous. Heroes don't always make the right choices. It's about the overcoming that makes sense to me. And so when I say that um, I'm not always a hero in my own story, it's not that I don't perceive myself as great. It's not that I don't perceive myself as worthy of celebration or love or any of those things, but I am not perfect. You know, and, and this idea that heroes are these shiny, like inanimate objects, really, at the end of the day, is wrong. You know, and so that's what I mean by that. It, it's absolutely not that I don't think I'm worthy of celebration. Oh, for sure I do. Um, but being a hero can be misleading. It makes you feel like they're not real people. And yeah. I am a very real person. No, definitely. And happy belated Mother's Day, by the way. Uh, I did see IL's post. And so that uh, connects me to my point on motherhood, which she said, you are so fun to be around. And she, um, you know, really is just so thankful for you in so many ways. And I want to say, you know, she's a teenager. Most teenage girls don't say about their moms that they're so fun to be around and that they're going to be, they like to be their friends. So congratulations to you. I think that's amazing. And I, I also think it's a testament to um, what you said in your book, where you really told her that I need to partner with you mm -hmm. as it relates to what I need from you and vice versa. And, and that's, you know, a unique way of parenting. And so I'd love for you to uh, dive a little deeper into that, because I think it'd be interesting for some of our listeners to hear today around the style in which you mother Leia. Yeah, well, look, I, I do take that as a big um, source of pride, you know, that she still wants to hang out with me when you know, she's almost 14 and right. you're right at that age. It's like, you rather get as far away from your mother as possible. You know? <laughs> so um, it is, it is a unique relationship and I am thankful for it. Not because like, I think I've been a perfect mother by any stretch of the imagination or that like I could write the handbook on motherhood. I wish somebody had given me the handbook <laughs> on motherhood, to be honest with you. Um, but because like our, our journey together has forced us to have a relationship that we have, you know? And it is not replicable. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's like if somebody looks at me and says, oh, I want to be the kind of mother you are, I'm like, then you would have had to have suffered the kind of trauma that I've suffered. You know, you would have had to go through the things I've had to go through in order to be the kind of mother I am. And so why would we do that? <laughs> you know, it's like, right. no, please don't wish that on yourself. You know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an easy journey at all. And, for me, it's like, yeah, the big win is the fact that we're able to be honest with each other. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that in a pithy way right. or like, you know, some sort of like, oh, these are hashtag goals as a parent. You want your kids to be honest with you. We all want our kids to be honest with you. But the truth is, how honest are you with your kids? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you want somebody to be honest with you, how honest are you with them? And that is what I learned the hard way 
when my husband passed away, her father, um, was the need for me to be more honest mm -hmm. as a parent. You know, not hiding from the things that are tough, from the things that make me sad, from the conflicts of having to raise her. You know, it's like, again, sometimes we think motherhood is supposed to be like this. You're supposed to be just some angel dropped down from heaven itself. You know, and the, the truth of the matter is that like, we all have some conflict in that. And for me, certainly as an ambitious career driven individual, I had to make some choices that sometimes did not put my daughter first. And I know that we're afraid to say that. I know that, you know, it's, it's like, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say you sacrifice everything for your kids, but why? You know, I'm like, what, what does that make you as a, as a human being, a contributor to society? I haven't, I haven't sacrificed everything for her. You know, and I think that's a hard thing to, to admit for some people. Sure. Um, but I think it makes you healthier and better as a parent, if you're able to admit that. There are many times when I have made the decision about something I want to do um, that put myself first. But I think I'm a better mother because of that. And I'm honest about that. And so we're able to discuss like, okay, what are the things that are really important to her that I have to show up for? And what are the things that are really important for me that I've got to do? You know, and, and that has made us more trusting of each other that honesty creates trust. And so I'm hopeful that that is what continues into her later teens and into her twenties and thirties and forties. You know what I mean? Like, I hope yeah, that that's yeah. the way our relationship is. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, well, you gave me a lot. I want to get into the boundary point around uh, something you highlighted because it's something that I think you um, speak to um, very often in your book and several themes around family, your relationship with your parents, friends, and setting healthy boundaries in general, just because of one of the key lines you said, which is from your mother around, she didn't put her fear on your heart in certain mm -hmm. moments where you made tough decisions. And I'd love for you to unpack that further, just because boundary setting in this environment today is very difficult with access to information everywhere, anxiety, mm -hmm. all these things are at an all time high. I find it, um, you know, very powerful that you were able to learn how to do that to set yourself up for all these ambitious goals that you had, putting yourself first when you learned from not doing that in the past. And it's a, a great thing throughout your book. So I'd love for you to go into that, please. Ruthie, do you mean that um, boundaries as a parent or what, what do you mean by that? Exactly? Um, boundaries in both ways. I think the set of the decisions you make that are, you know, more unique than others. So for example, the honesty around how you're going to deal um, with Layla as a mother, and then also the boundaries that you set with other people so that when you make your own decisions that you aren't taking in information from everybody else and being able to follow your own path. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, those boundaries are based on self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? The, you can't create a boundary if you don't know where your boundaries are. Right. You know, it sounds like a dust statement, but I think it's the most basic of understandings, you know, which is just like, what is the understanding of self? And then deciding where that line is. Now, the trick, of course, is that most of us do know where our boundaries lie. We just let them get pushed around. Right. <laughs> you know? So we just don't stop anybody from crossing them. You know, that's, that's what happens. And, and Maybe that's not just work. That's also, like I said, in, in being a parent and child rearing right. and being a partner. You know, it's like you have a boundary and you let somebody cross it. You know, it's not that you didn't know where it was. You knew where it was. You just didn't do anything about it when they crossed that line, you know? Right. And I think that for me is what has been the difference maker is understanding where my boundaries are and then communicating those boundaries and then sticking by them, right? right? And that... that understanding is equally as important in the boardroom as it is at home. So there, there, to me, there is no difference. And that's why when, you know, we talk about, um, you know, sort of like these two sides, whether you're talking about professional or personal, mm -hmm. I find that so confusing because we're just tricking ourselves into thinking that we're different people in these different spaces. And we're really not, you know, you're right. really the same person. You just behave differently in different situations. And so if your boundaries are set up because you're self-aware about what you need and how you want to be treated and the kind of communication you want to have, all of those things, like they work 
in both spaces, both in the professional and in the personal. And so I think for me, the boundary setting has come easier because I'm self-aware and unwilling to sacrifice myself for anybody else's comfort. Love it. That's great. No, thank you. Um, well, with that in mind, I want to get a little further into the book in terms of finding your voice and communicating this effectively for all of us to uh, learn and read about today. So um, it's almost been three months since the book was released on February 21st, just a month after your um, birthday. And so I'm curious what you've learned um, since this uh, memoir has been released. And obviously, you have a marketing mastermind. How have you used it um, to promote your own book? Oh, gosh. Well, look, I made a reel about it. <laughs> Yes, which I, I reposted. I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, look, it was it was a lot of work. I'll tell you that, sure. you know, it's like um, being the subject and also the strategic mind is, mm -hmm. is very difficult to do. I did not appreciate that before I started this process. You know, it's like it's hard to, to turn on and off, you know, and say, OK, now I got to move into the mode of being talent. And then oh, got to reevaluate, you know, the plan and the strategy and make some changes when, you know, it's necessary. So that's been very, very difficult. Um, and if I can be totally transparent, I don't think I have yet been able to really assess what I've learned from this process. You know, perhaps what I learned while writing, um, sure. but what I've learned in promotion, I don't think I have, I've had enough space yet. You know, as you said, it's been three months, which maybe to some people feels like a long time, but it really is not. You know, I, I'm still on book promo. Hence right. this conversation. No, that's here. Here. You know what I mean? So so I'm still in the middle of it. Uh, so I don't know that there's any learnings yet, but I do think that um, in book writing and in telling a story about yourself, uh, my process was to try to be as honest as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, again, just back to that self-awareness. Uh, look, two people could have a experience of an event and see it from two different perspectives and come out with two different understandings. And so I have said again and again and again that ma my memoir is my memoir. Mm -hmm. You know, it is my, those are my memories that I am talking about, that I am expressing. I didn't set out to write an encyclopedia of events. You know, I didn't set out to write the Wikipedia version of events. I wrote it to tell my own story and from my perspective and how that has affected my life. And hopefully if anybody takes anything from it, they can use it part of their own journey in their own healing or their own movement through trauma and loss, et cetera. So for me, the lesson has been about not lying to yourself, you know, about your story and about what you've been through or what you are experiencing. It is how to continue to be radically honest with self and therefore be even <clears throat> and therefore be even better because of your honesty. Sure. No, that's great. Well, can we get into this cover art here? Um, I think it is beautiful. I did some research in terms of understanding the importance of cover art and the idea of your name and title being clear from across the room. Um, <laughs> I'd love if you could just tell the inspiration behind it. Um, I know the heart, your heart is what is on display. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd love to understand just a little bit more, just so people can know where to find it because of how it looks. Yeah, well, you know, some things are are just plain as daylight. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that's the actually the beauty of marketing. What I have learned over the decades of marketing is that you know you can't be too intricate when you are you know creating call it a logo or a cover or a piece of art. It's like, look, sometimes it's just you just kind of let it be plain. You know, let them know. Um, I decided not to use myself or my husband as, as covers or my college boyfriend or Eve or Lael or my parents. I decided not to put a person on the cover because truly this is a, a story about the fluidity of love, you know, through time and space and experiences. And so that's what I wanted to express. Um, the, the deeper meanings about, you know, it's like where things are placed or uh, where, you know, my name appears. I certainly did. I didn't have a point of view on that for sure. Okay. Um, but the, the color in the background I chose because um, for me, it represents like that moment, that color just before dawn, you know, when the sky is turning from black to sunlight, you know, there's a specific color of obsidian 
that shows up, you know, and I, I really love that color. It just reminds me of the promise of what is going to happen in that day. And so if there was anything, it was that. That's it. That's the only rule I had, you know, to show yeah. my heart and to have obsidian. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, well, let's get into the reason for the book in terms of some of the losses that you experienced in these monumental losses, uh, particularly your husband. Um, you had three major losses, including your college uh, boyfriend, your mm -hmm. husband, and of course, your first daughter. And I want to talk about how that has informed your way of thinking about urgency of where mm -hmm. we are today, but also, um, you know, the lessons that you took away from each of them, because I know one was um, inspiration, the other was love, and then the last one being living urgently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a real testament, of course, to experiences that we have with people okay. that um, no two relationships are alike at all. All of us know that, right? Okay. It's like the relationship, even if you have like multiple children, you know, it's like any parent would tell you that the relationship you have with one child is not like the other. Now, of course, we all aim to love our kids equally and all those things, um, but the relationships are not the same, you know, and, and think about your group of friends, right? It's like, look, even if you claim to have like seven besties, your relationship with each of them is a little bit different, you know, or siblings, like, you know, relationships are just so fluid. They're so specific to time and to place and to situation that for me, each of the relationships that I talk about in my book whether they um, are relationships that still exist today, you know, meaning like the relationship I have with my father, which I talk about a lot in my book, or the relationship I had with Ben before he died by suicide are very different, you know, and right. have taught me such different things. And I, I do believe that there is an opportunity for us to look at our relationships as a reflection, you know, of our own experiences rather than just casually living them, you know, or casually engaging in them. It makes me, just talking about awareness, makes me more aware, you know, of the relationships that I have. And so today it's like, I, we've already talked about my relationship with my daughter, but I'm very aware in that relationship. You know, I don't, it's not casual to me. Um, the relationship I have with my colleagues, you know, depending on the company, I don't take casually. You know, I'm, I'm very intentional in those relationships uh, with romantic partners. Like this is, I think that there's just a, a beautiful way of experiencing life when you start to really look at each of these relationships as, as more than just obligations. You know, maybe that's the right word that sometimes we're in these situations and you see it as an obligation. You know, the relationship you have with your wife or your husband feels like an obligation because you've been together for so long, right. you know, but why is it an obligation? You know, why are you in the relationship? Do you still enjoy it? You know, does it bring you happiness and joy, love, comfort, you know, maybe financial security, whatever the thing is. I'm not saying that there's a right answer, but I think awareness of how each of our relationships fulfills us is really important to pay attention to. And so you're right, at the end of my book, when I encapsulate what each of the relationships um, that unfortunately are no longer with me, what they taught me, I was very thoughtful about what that means. And I use that same thoughtfulness now in life and in my relationships with people who are living. I love it. That's beautiful. Well, I, I do want to stick on the idea of um, this thoughtfulness in terms of how it goes to other areas, um, particularly as it relates to Peter, because he is such a central figure in the mm -hmm. sense of the life you're living now because of him, how it impacted your professional ambitions and decisions and um, decisions to you know, move to LA shortly after he passed away because of a job opportunity. I'm curious in terms of this urgent life, if Peter was here today and the thoughtfulness that you are sharing with us now, what do you think? Would he be bought into this urgent lifestyle? Would he be thinking um, similar to you? Because I know there were some things where you guys um, were not seeing eye to eye, but with growth and obviously time uh, that may have changed. So I am Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I have thought like, I wonder what Peter would think about this thing. Right. You know, that's a, that's a constant feeling. Mm. Um, 
unfortunately, I don't have the power to answer the question. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. There's so many unanswered questions, you know, about current time. Yeah. Um, what I will tell you is this. I have, I have also learned that very much like a film that came out in 1998 called Sliding Doors. Yeah. It's um, it, Gwyneth Paltrow starred in it. And it was basically the idea, and you've probably heard the concept before, but it was like, you know, you choose to go on this train and your life is different and you choose to go on that train and your yeah. life is different. You know, it's like this idea that our experiences are and our destinies are made about made up of the small choices that we make every single day. Mm. And so I do not believe that my life would be what it is if Peter had lived. I don't, I don't believe that. I think it would be very different. How would it be different? I'm not sure, you know, but the impact of his life on mine has been significant, you know, because yes, his death taught me to live life more urgently. You know, it made me more obstinate about what I want in my life and how to center myself. You know, it just made me more ambitious about how I want to live in a way that really allows me to do everything that I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't yeah. know if I would have had that same type of energy had he lived. And it is the reason why when, you know, I talk to people who have suffered any kind of loss or trauma um, and loss and trauma doesn't have to be death. You right. know, it can, it can be any, any kind, whatever you feel you have lost or, or have uh, missed out on. Um, I'm always curious when they feel like it has been unfair, you know, because I think unfairness is such a strange concept also, you know, is it unfair that Peter lost his life? Of course, you know, I wish that he could have lived to 107. But would he have been 107 and think, oh, I got to make it to 108th birthday, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but also the fact that perhaps the inspiration of that idea is what then forces me to not want to wait to do anything in my life. You know, that because of his death, it encourages me to live even bigger, right? Because I don't want to leave this planet not having done the things I want to do. And that means that I still have very high ambitions and big, big goals, but I'm also living in a way that if I were to go tomorrow, I'd be very satisfied with the life I've lived, you know? And that is what inspires me every day to behave in the way that I do. Got it. Well, in the spirit of living right now in this period that you're in, which I call it, um, the time without a title. You don't have the title since you have left um, Netflix, a professional title. You still have certainly other important titles now. Um, I'm curious how you are leaning into this kind of period of reinvention, um, what it's been like, you know, over the past, I guess, a year and, and some change now, where um, you've stepped away from a major role at Netflix, and um, you're leaning into your own uh, path as a, as a published author but also navigating life without a professional title in the formal sense. Um, yeah. What has that been like? Um, well, you know, here's the thing is that evolution is constant, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's what they say. Well, the only thing, is, the only, what is the word? What's the phrase? It's like the only constant is change. Something yes. like that. <laughs> um, I see it very much the same way. And, and again, I don't see myself as two different people. Right a half which is professional and a half which is personal. And so I don't, I don't see myself as someone who's like, oh, what do I do now without a quote unquote title? You know, it's like my evolution has always been about stepping into the next role and into the next thing that is available in my life. You know, and so the way that I'm looking at it now is that like, yes, I am, I have left companies. Netflix was not the first one. You know, I've left many of them uh, and have assumed other titles. And as you said, you know, there are now different titles that I have. And so for me, it's like, how do I continue to push forward in evolution, which makes me even a greater person than I already am? You know, because again, it's like, look, the idea that you move from one thing to another and you don't grow is actually pretty terrible, I think. You know, it's like, if you're, if you're considering 
if you're in a position, you know, in which you're like, oh gosh, I've got to step away from this job and you know, maybe you're going to strike out and be an entrepreneur, or maybe you're going to be a stay-at-home parent, or maybe you're just going to travel the world. The, the title and the identity has just simply evolved, you know, mm-hmm. and that's the way I consider myself now, which is that I'm in, I'm in, I'm in evolution, right. you know, which is so fantastic. And what an exciting time, you know, to discover new identities about myself uh, and also lean into some of the identities I already have. You know, and it's like, like I said, it's like motherhood is one in which it's like, look, things, I am a different mother today than I was a year ago. Um, But that is also because Lael is almost 14 and not almost 13, you know, so she has learned new things and we're tackling new challenges. So I, I very much enjoy my evolution. You know, I'm not at all afraid of it. And I have never been afraid of moving from one thing to another. Sure. I love that. Well, do you have some advice for people listening around how to step into and like rise in the confidence in that? Because I, I do think, um, you know, this is long fought to get to this place in terms of being comfortable with that. And so I just love a little insight into maybe steps you took, particularly probably with writing the book to feel comfortable in sharing your story around, um, you know, being comfortable with evolution, being comfortable with not knowing what's next. And yeah. also, um, you know, setting yourself up for success, uh, whatever that looks like to you. Yeah, no, it's really an important discussion to have, you know, and again, this is why I caution people from the practice of like getting too much input from anyone outside of yourself, you know, because then you're not dependent on yourself for the answers that you seek. For me, it's like, how do you gain comfortability in evolution? Well, it's about knowing self and understanding where it is that you're trying to go. It's like, look, I would not be comfortable if I was not confident already in what I've already achieved, what I've already completed, you know, understanding that I needed to move into a new space in order to grow, you know, that I need new tools for my toolbox, you know, that I already have a hammer, I already have nails, I already have a wrench. So what's the next tool I need to get? I need a power (laughs) saw. You know what I mean? And so I think part of the exercise for anyone who is listening, who is wondering like, gosh, how do I gain the confidence in my own evolution and get comfortable in the evolution, whether it is that you have to make the active decision to leave a job or a situation and step into something else is like, what is it that you actually need from the next thing? What is missing in your life that you feel like you need to go over here and get that thing? You know, and the thing is that like, look, again, there are no wrong answers. Your answer could be that I need more money. And then, yeah, you should be excited about your evolution because you're evolving into being a wealthier person. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Or like maybe your need is like, if you're in a relationship and you're like, oh, this is kind of not really satisfying me the way it was. And you're like, I need more love. Then the evolution in removing yourself out of that relationship should give you confidence and comfortability because you're in the search of to be more loved. Right. You know, I find that evolution and being confident in it is only achieved if you are, if you understand what it is that you're trying to grow into and what you want. It is a much better motivator to reach your hand out to grab the next thing than it is to let go of the thing that you just left. Uh. Now, let's, this is another interesting thought around, um, you know, leaning into some of these motivations and also um, dealing with sometimes the negative uh, repercussions that come with them. So whether it is being more vulnerable in asserting your boundaries or sharing that you need more help in one area that you didn't um, need before. And sometimes, and particularly in, in corporate America, I know in your experience that, um you know, you can be received differently than others just based on the two main factors of identity um, as a Black woman in this country. And so I am curious how you've dealt with some of those vulnerabilities that you've had to turn that negative experience around when, um, you know, you've been trying to lean into all the things that you have just said. Hmm. Um, I think that's, again, part of it is just about self-awareness and self-confidence. I think that can become a theme of our conversation here, you know, which is that um, I don't know that there is nirvana Mm -hmm. anywhere. And I don't see that 
as negative sure. or morbid. You know, it's not, it's not a detractor to me that there isn't nirvana. <laughs> you know, I think then I'm like, oh, well, then I have to create it. Mm, yeah. You know, if, there, if one doesn't exist outside of myself, then I have to create it. And so I have not been overly concerned with other people's negativity or their concerns about my vulnerability because I'm trying to create nirvana for myself. Meaning that when I have needed grace or space in a work environment or in a relationship with friends or anything else, I am trying to create that nirvana and that peace inside of myself for myself. And so it makes it much easier, you know, to be able to face that scare right. you know, of sharing when I know I'm doing it in pursuit of creating more peace for myself. So I e in a work environment, right? When I have shared that, like, look, I'm a single mom, right? As I've, I've expressed, and I need some time in the evening to be able to take care of my daughter or do whatever I need to do in order to get ready for the next day. And therefore I can't make a meeting. Okay. It is because I'm trying to create my own peace and my own nirvana, you know, because should I engage in whatever meeting is happening at eight o'clock at night, I'm going to be torn up right. about <laughs> wanting to be over here doing this thing with my kid. Right. You know, so my nirvana is what I am trying to create. And that is why then I feel more brave in being vulnerable about the situation I'm in so that I'm able to then take on whatever that thing is, whatever that scary vulnerability is, because I'm trying to create nirvana for myself. If in the opposite, I said, oh, you know what? I need to find a job which allows me to not have meetings eight o'clock at night and not bother me in the time when I'm trying to you know, take care of my child. Maybe I find that position for like three months and then all of a sudden, guess what happens? Right. Somebody gonna pop up and say, you know what, we really need that meeting at eight. And then I'm gonna be pissed because I'll be like, oh, but I thought this was Nirvana. And I'm mad because I'm like, oh, this is not it. Ah, off I go trying to find it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, vulnerability and bravery and all those things are based on the fact of knowledge of self and trying to create my own Nirvana in my life. I love it. Let's dive into Nirvana. I feel like last weekend you went to Miami for F1 and then you flew back to LA for the premiere of The Little Mermaid. I was so jealous. I loved all the photos. <laughs> I cannot wait for obviously the premiere to come out and see Hallie in a rare form. And mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about some of these expansive experiences you're having, not only with some of your best friends, but also your daughter. Um, in the month of May, and then also going forward right now, because it looks fabulous. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It is fabulous. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm having a very good time with all of it. Um, but I just have, you know, I just, I enjoy my life. You know, mm -hmm. I enjoy, I enjoy everything. Uh, and so that is probably what is coming across more than anything else is that yeah. I am very appreciative and very grateful for the life I live, the nirvana I'm creating for myself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I'm also really excited about the work that I do in Ghana, you know, which has been so fulfilling and enriching. And so for me, it's like, look, I'm, um, if I told you that I had a plan for what's happening in July, I'd be lying to you because I don't know, but I am certainly open to the universe and whatever is coming that I am going to enjoy that fully, you know, that, um, yes. when you read in my book, it's like, look, the, the opening quote in it is from Diane Ackerman, who's one of my favorite authors, and I'll paraphrase it. And it says, um, I don't want to get to the end of my life and just have lived the length of it. I want to have lived the width of it as well. And for me, that's what I am doing. I'm living the width of my life. So whether it is F1 in Miami right. or TD Jake Summit in Orlando or Ghana in March or going with my daughter on her birthday trip, Whatever it is, I'm throwing myself all in. I love it. Well, let's talk about Ghana because in the book, you mentioned the experience when um, you brought Peter to Ghana and also the specific experience when you went to um, Cape Coast Slave Castle. Um, I also went on that went on that same journey 
uh, with people mm. who were not black. And I know what that experience was like. Um, and it was hard. And so I'm curious in terms of Ghana, which is, you know, part of you know, central to your identity, um, from a community activism standpoint, from the year of the return, from all of these things that um, you had participated in, particularly, um, you know, leading Vice President uh, Kamala to, the, to a mm -hmm. recent trip there as well. You know, what else are you excited about in terms of um, doing work with Ghana, doing work in Ghana in the upcoming future? Well, I, I enjoy that work because it's bigger than me, right? And I don't say that lightly. The work of creating a new narrative for the Black diaspora is central to everything that I want to do in my life. You know, I think it is a culmination of so many identities that I have. So yes, being a child of Ghanaian immigrants to the United States means that I identify both with the African-American experience because I grew up in America, Black, and it wasn't like anybody saw me. I was just like, oh, you're from Ghana, right? No, nobody said that. <laughs> you know, just right. just here with everybody else, you know. Um, but then also being able to go with my parents to Ghana, mm -hmm. right, and then eventually on my own as an adult, um, also created another identity, you know, being Ghanaian. Right. And it is when I met the president of Ghana in 2017 that I understood better how I could contribute to the mission of blackness in the world meaning that my work as a marketer and as somebody who creates narratives, I could apply that to how we engage in the world. Um, being 12 years old and being in, you know, Colorado Springs, Colorado, when I would see the commercials that everybody else saw, you know, with African kids with distended bellies and flies on their eyes, told a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they said this child is worth one cent and please contribute one cent to this person's livelihood, they can, su they can suffice on one cent. They weren't just talking about black kids in Africa. Right. It applied to your face too. It applied to every black face that walks the planet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why we're confused about thinking that there's anything that separates us really. And so for me, the narrative of changing how Africa is viewed, I felt very connected to the president of Ghana when he said that at the UN General Assembly in 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, he said that until the continent of Africa is respected, no person of African descent anywhere would be respected. And so is it a wonder that there are challenges with racism and with police brutality and with all kinds of biases, regardless of where you are on the planet and being black? I don't think so. Right. You know, if you don't have respect for the continent, then how do you expect to have respect for its descendants? And so the work I'm doing now is all about that. You know, so whether it is about celebrating the music and the fashion and the food and the entertainment of the continent, or it's about being in the delegation with Kamala Harris, who makes her historic first visit to the continent. Yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna help, you know, change the narrative of the continent. And I hope that the work that I'm doing will inspire more people to come and experience the continent for themselves. And that's really the mission. I love it. Well, I am following along on that journey. Um, we are at 716, so I want to make sure that I open it up um, for questions and keep us on time. But you know, I could ask you plenty more. So let me do a little check here um, and see before I move on to my other set. Um, okay. My question. Anthony, have I set this up so? Well, while I'm pulling up the questions, I have mm -hmm. another question for you, okay. which is, um, I used to work at Google. I looked at your Google trend data, and I don't know if you've seen this recently, but I was looking at how your name has popped and the urgent life has popped 
Great. since um, February 21st, really the beginning of this year. <laughs> and I don't know if you knew this, but I your don't know name anything. in the book is popping in countries that I don't know if they're surprised to you, like the UAE, like mm -hmm. South Africa, like mm -hmm. Canada, like Singapore. And um, one, I think that's a testament to you being a global phenomenon, which is just incredible. But two, um, I think it speaks to this idea of being relatable across cultural differences, mm. continents, and anything else in between. Because I don't know who the people were who were looking, I just know where they are based. And so because of that, um, you know, what do you think about that? And also, do you have any plans to travel to any of these places for your book tour? Maybe you should ask. Oh, Ruthie, that's like the number one question always, right? Okay. Like on Instagram, people are like, when are you coming to right. fill in the blank? And I'm I like, y'all, I'm like, I am one human being. I can't go everywhere, you know? Right. Um, but I, I, you know, it's funny. Um, people always complain about social media and like what a ill it is to us. Sure. And I actually don't think it's all bad, like anything else in the planet, right? It's like, yes, if you eat too much ice cream, meh, it's probably not healthy, okay? Right. But some ice cream brings you joy, fantastic, do it. For me, social media has really been a joy. It's built a community that I don't think I would have had access to if it didn't exist mm -hmm. and allowed me to talk to people in so many different types of places, you know? And that's actually the beautiful thing about, you know, the study of pop culture and, and what I feel has become sort of the cornerstone of my work, uh, which is that we have so many interconnected interests and mm -hmm. stories that you cannot believe that someone who is in Singapore really shares no interest with you. Right. I have been in enough situations, walked into enough rooms where there's nobody like me in the room to know that that's not true. You know, that as right. soon as you open your mouth and you are curious about the world, about people, about their experiences, you will find like-minded people. And like-minded is not necessarily like the arguments that we see on Facebook right now. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that we have to have the same political beliefs or same religious beliefs or anything like that in order for us to get along. The question is that like, how curious are you about somebody else's experience? You know, somebody else's life. Right. And you are interested in it. I'm sure that their telling is going to affect you in some capacity, which is probably going to be positive, you know? Mm -hmm. And if not, it's just be a learn. <laughs> so um, I'm very excited by this uh, Google trend data. I'm yeah. like, I would like to see it myself to see what's I'll going on. I'll send it to you afterwards. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. It. <laughs> um, I do see the questions now, so I'm going to go back to the chat. So okay. the first one is, um, I love your comment about uh, not living two lives, both personal and professional. Um, mm -hmm. How did you learn that? Were you raised that way? How does your skin tone and your style influence um, you living out loud and so authentic authentically uh, when so many Black women grapple with colorism and respectability politics? Mm, yeah. Well, um, no, I don't think I was born like that. Um, I learned a lot of it through just experience of life, you know. Um, probably the biggest turning point for me um, was at work. Mm. You know, when um, I was a, I was, I would call it like junior to mid-level manager. And I was in the middle of getting a review, and I had done my best to correct the issues that I'd had in my last review, most of them superficial, right? About the way that I express myself or my excitement level, which can sometimes appear as aggressive or whatever, you oh, know? Um, yeah, or any number of things, you know? It's like, and the challenge for me was that I was trying to not be the things that I am and I was still failing at it. Mm. By the way, I didn't think I was failing at it. They told me I was failing at it, <laughs> right? I was like, I thought I was, I was failing. Yeah, because they said, you know, be less passionate in meetings. Be less, no, they said be less aggressive. And I was like, ooh, okay, that means don't raise my voice. So then I made my voice like this and would try to talk like this all the time without any excitement in it. So that it wouldn't be aggressive and wouldn't be scary to anybody. And it wasn't working. You know, mm. they told me, they were like, ugh. You know, it's just that sometimes your colleagues, so was that failure, you know, of not meeting the expectation of how I was supposed to change myself into a whole new being 
that made me realize that I can't be two people. First of all, it's too tiring. Right. You know, it just takes up so much air and space. And so imagine that you're, we're all working with 100%, okay? And your colleague is able to be the same person in the office as he is outside. So he's just at 100% all the time. Right. You, on the other hand, have split yourself into two. You're one person outside the office, another person in the office. Now you have 50%. You're competing at 50% against Homeboy, who's at 100. Right. You know, that, to, that math alone made me pause. And I was like, wait, hold on. This, this is not possible. So even if it felt like, hey, look, I'm going to be shunned or held back uh, because I'm bringing 100% of myself, I knew that there was no way to win at 50%. My only shot was at 100%. And so if it meant that the environment in which I was 100% was not right. conducive to my success, then that's when I knew that I had to make a change. And again, I don't say that lightly, like, oh, let me just pick up my bag and go. You got to make a plan. You got to get right. a strategy together. You know, But don't be fooled into thinking that the 50% you are bringing is going to win. It is not. Right. That's, that's a good one. Uh, thank you for that. The next question is, what advice would you give someone who is mid-career and not excited about their path? How can they tap into the spirit of living urgently? Mm. Mm. Look, I don't even know how to answer that. Because I'm like, <laughs> you're not excited about your path. So why are you on it? I, I'm like- Read the book. Read the book. There's five to that. Yeah, but, I, but honestly, I'm just like, if you're not excited about the path you're on, you have the power to change it. Right. You really do. You know, and again, I'm not saying that like, you've got to get up and quit your job today and maybe be homeless tomorrow. I'm not saying that. You know, nobody said you've got to be irresponsible, but get a plan together. You absolutely have the power to. And the moment that you don't think you have the power to change it, that's when you fail. That's when you right. lose. And so in gathering yourself, again, this is not about going to other people and asking for their opinion and what do they think about this and what do they think about that? What about yourself? Yourself. Like, what do you think you want? How do you want to live life in a way that's going to make you happy to wake up every day? Answer that question. And look, it's not necessarily going to be easy breezy for you if you have not been doing the work of strengthening your intuition, you know, that gut feeling, that voice that is telling you, if you haven't been doing that work, then I encourage you to start doing that work. You know, again, the, I think the first step is, is actually a pretty easy one. It's easy to say, it's not easy to do, uh -huh. which is that stop asking other people for their opinion. Right. You know, when you stop asking other people for their opinion, then you'll be able to better answer for yourself. What is it that I want to do? What do I want to do here in this life, in this experience? What do I want to do next month? You know, and then you start making the plans to make that a reality. That's urgency. Urgency is not just about like doing things like quick, 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 you know, right now. It's about the intention of getting to that place that you really want to be in. Love it. Okay. The next one is you are an amazing role model, Boss. I love your thoughts on evolution. How do you combat the fear when going through the evolution? How do you keep going when fear gets in the way? Yeah. I think fear is natural. Fear is a very good thing. It protects us. You know, it's just that um, your fear can't become so consuming that it stops your happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, I think really the idea for me of like living a life that is unfulfilled is scarier to me than being comfortable in a life that isn't. And so fear exists in both spaces. You know, I'm inspired because I'm afraid of living an unfulfilled life. And so that's why I get up and I'm like, oof, okay, this is a big jump, but let me go ahead and jump. Yeah. <laughs> because the idea to me of like sitting still and being unhappy, oof, that is scary. That is terrible. I don't want anything to do with that. And so I wouldn't consider that you experience life in the absence of fear, mm. you know, but that you use your fear to inspire you to move in that evolution, to get to someplace better. Uh, I love it. We are almost at time. So I want to give you the opportunity to share with us what you think 
um, we can do in terms of the takeaways from this book, what you'd like to guide us to. I know you have badass uh, workshops as well, and there's so much to you that um, I want to share with the world today. And so help me close out. What are the things that we should take? The main takeaways we think um, you think we should take and also um, where to learn more about you and your tremendous life. Oh, well, thank you. I'll keep it short, Ruthie, um, which is that make them remember your name. Mm. That's it. Make them remember your name. I love it. That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's not hard to do so for you. So that it is a good place to be. Apparently in Singapore, they know my name already. So I, you don't want to take that. <laughs> listen, yes, no, it is true. And I think that's wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much. I mean, you've captivated uh, my heart and attention for several years now. And I'm so glad that I was able to share this with uh, people in the Stanford, Connecticut community, a com Connecticut place that you have spent a significant time yeah. in. And also with everybody else, we'll be able to share this with afterwards. Um, I think this came at a phenomenal time. And um, the library's theme for next month is people who are finding their voices. So I think this is a great thing to tap into. Um, and I hope that everyone gets to uh, read The Origin Life or listen on audiobooks as well. Even more powerful. Thank you so much, Ruthie. I appreciate it. Thank All you. Right. Thanks Take for your time. Care, everybody. <laughs>